I gave you the road. Why don't you take it? Ah, oh, what a miserable meathead. Why don't you go? Boy, that would asphyxiate you. Head on. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margo P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host, Margo D. of Brooklyn Fitchick. Hi, everyone. My snakes! <laughs> the snakes! That's my favorite point of this movie, this this week's movie. My snakes! Um... Today, we're going to have a really fun episode. But before we get to that, we picked up a lot of new people in January when we were talking about um, movies that have been adapted from plays, not necessarily books. So in case you're wondering about that, yeah, we usually do books. But when the pandemic started, we decided to do a brand new episode every single week. And so we've expanded what we mean by book to mean literally any literary source. So any movie that's been adapted from a literary source, what any whatever it is magazine article, a play, um, I don't know, song. television commercial. Yeah, a song. We will consider it. We will consider doing it. And it also means that we're always looking for suggestions. So if you've recently joined us and you're wondering, I wonder if they did this. I wonder if they did that. First of all, we've been doing this for nine years. So there's a good chance we have. Secondly, you know, one of our listeners, uh, Thaddeus, made a an index of all of the episodes that we've ever done and you can see that index in our Facebook group and also meet other listeners of the podcast and interact with us, make your suggestions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we do have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like it. For some reason, the episodes just post there first. So we do have a private Facebook group. You, have, you type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group in Facebook and ask to join. We really do just talk about the episodes and books and movies ideas. We have that pinned up there, Thaddeus's post for us which we really appreciate on instagram and twitter we're at book versus a movie spell that all out we also have an old-timey email book versus movie podcast at gmail.com send us your suggestions for books movies and the thing that we have to ask is that the source has to be easy for us to get our hands on and the movie needs to be on a major streaming app so if we have to buy a dvd off of ebay it's just not going to work those are the big places. Also, if you would like some stickers, Margo, I, I went a little sticker crazy. I forgot. I got clear stickers <gasps> oh, I sent love those. to you. Yep. yep. So we've cool. got lots and lots of stickers. We've had lots and lots of new people. So if you're interested, please send us an email. We will drop them in the mail for you wherever you are on the planet of Earth. 
Yeah, we really appreciate you guys t- tuning in and listening in and, and participating um, in our virtual book club of the air. Mm-hmm. If you are wondering, like again, if you're one of our one of our newer uh, listeners and you're wondering, like, where can I hear you see that index? And you're like, well, where's that episode? A lot of them are on Patreon, which is where you can join and help support us and um, keep this you know we're not getting rich off of this we're no. just keeping the just keeping the lights on and uh, keeping yes. those keeping the books uh coming to our our respective homes <laughs> but we appreciate all of you who join us on patreon yeah we have a new member uh, jenny and she will actually said margo thank you for the card i think there's an avocado card that you sent to her yeah she loved it uh, well you know california right i'm in brooklyn she's in and by the way both named margo in case this is new for you yes p-a-t-r-e-o-n we have st- about 200 episodes up there we've been doing the show like margo said for nine years we're putting everything from 2020 and then previous to that up on the wall it's going to be 2021 soon so we're trying to keep a two-year deck of shows that'll always be available for you now if you go to that patreon wall you can just look around in there there's a bunch of stuff there that's free because it's like the old old stuff so maybe there's an old old recording you're like maybe you should redo that check it out we really appreciate it p-a-t-r-e-o-n we have a couple of very affordable options and literally it's for the books and the movies and like the software to put the show together we are not paying our mortgages with it we will someday we hope but that is the truth but if money is tight if you could do us a favor and wherever you get your podcasts, however they have you rate shows, if it's like hitting a button for stars or swiping it or whatever, or leaving a review, that would be amazing. We haven't had an iTunes review in a while. So if you leave us a five-star review on iTunes, we'll mention you on the air and we'll both be very grateful or ask for a sticker, put on your laptop, go to the coffee shop. Lots of you show us your laptops on with your with our stickers on it. We think that's really cool. Or tell a friend about the show or like Tony who bought my book in Nova Scotia. He went to a local person, his local bookstore, and then told him about our show. And now they're following us. Right. That's amazing. Thank you. We really, I mean, I can't, it's hard for me to, it sounds corny when I talk about it, but it is, it just means so much to us. Um, So if you've been a, a listener for a while, then you may have heard us talk about well, you certainly have heard us talk about today's director, and you may have heard us talk about today's author. Uh, we are dipping into the rich, rich well that is Steven Spielberg and our author, too. We've talked about Richard Matheson um, before, but for those of you who are new, maybe you don't know who Richard Matheson is, you are definitely aware of his work. So much of his work is just a part of popular American culture. Mm-hmm. that It's like one of those things that people don't even know what the source is is, um, including today's story. But let's talk about some of Richard Matheson's um, most famous works and a little bit about the man himself. He was born in New Jersey, 1926. He was a Brooklyn boy. He was raised in Brooklyn and went to high school and college out in Brooklyn. He's a very prolific, like Margo said, science fiction writer, horror writer. He wrote a lot of screenplays. He wrote a lot of teleplays for Twilight Zone, um, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, The Man he at 10,000 Feet. Is that yeah, it? that's just like the best Twilight Zone yes. episode ever. It's the one with Captain Kirk and the weird creature out on the you know, uh, wing of the airplane. Ah! It's still scary. <laughs> it's still so scary. It's still as, as crazy as it is. It's still really scary. He also wrote, I am legend, which we covered. I'm sure that's on the Patreon wall by now. There's the Omega man. Uh, there's the, the pit and the pendulum. The Another incredible favorite shrinking of mine, man. the incredible shrinking man. I mean, I yeah. love, I love that movie. There's also Bid Time Return, which is somewhere in time. Somebody's been, we've been asked that one a bunch of times. I'd love to do that one. That's him too. And then there was uh, the uh, What Dreams May Come True, which is one Mm -hmm. of the saddest movies I ever saw in my life. (laughs) But he was very, very prolific, being my point, and, and is an inspiration mm-hmm. to a lot of other writers, such as Stephen King. And he also is, um, a, Steven Spielberg was a big fan of his work because he would always check who were the writers on all these shows that he loved. So today's story is something that is based on a true story in his life. True-ish. <laughs> True-ish. He was playing, it was November 22nd, 1963. And if you're wondering if that date sounds... Notable, that is the date of John F. Kennedy's assassination in Dallas, Texas. He was Mm -hmm. the president. And it happened uh, like one or two in the afternoon, if I remember from all those news clips. 
Richard Matheson was at the golf club with a buddy of his. And they were just playing around. And then they hear that the president was shot. And they said, we better go home, you know. And so he and his friend were driving home. And they were all, you know, listening to the radio and sad. And then all of a sudden, a truck started tailgating them. And it, he did it for miles. And I don't know if you've ever been chased by another car. I have a couple of yeah. times. Oh, yes. I it's, mean, I live in California. If you right. live in California, it's bound to happen sooner or later because they're just wackos out there. Wackos, angry people, dudes just looking for dates. Like, this is not a way to do it, by the way. I mean, but it's it's happened and it's always terrifying and it's scary. And I can only imagine on a date like that, when it always, you know, you're wondering what's going to happen to the world, the president. Just and you're already killed. feeling like super vulnerable right. and scared and uncertain. And then this guy shows up. Oh, yeah. So they basically they they got away from this trucker and I don't know how they did, but they did. And then he said this would be a great story. That's the way he processed it. And it is a great story. So he pitched it to Twilight Zone. He pitched it to a whole bunch of other places. And Alfred Hitchcock presents. He wanted to make a series out of it. No one would do it. They were just like, no, no, no. It's it's I don't know why. So he said, fine. Well, I can sort of understand why, because just on the surface of it, and I mean, like talking about this movie, which we'll discuss in, in, shortly, but um I mean, this is the, the, here's the movie, you know, you go to pitch the movie. So here, here's what it is, is a guy, a, a salesman is traveling. He's on a car trip to his next um, client and a truck is tailgating him and they keep passing each other. And that goes on for 90 minutes, the end. <laughs> yeah. And then like in the it end. It sounds so dumb. Right. And they always, almost always filmed at studios. They didn't film on location very often. The That's budgets... the other thing. Yes. Right. Nobody wants to be out in the desert shooting cars and trucks it's for days and days on end. You don't know what the weather's going to be like. You have to have really good drivers. It's got to, you know, it, there's a lot that are like, well, how are you going to sustain a story? This is five years before there's Jaws. So there's, they don't understand what they have here. Steven Spielberg is our director. And he, so anyway, with the story, he published it in April of 1971 in Playboy magazine. And what happens is Steven Spielberg is 24 years old. Yeah. Reading Playboy for the articles. Right. Well, his assistant did. His assistant (laughs) did. And she said, I got a story for you. He goes, really? And she goes, no, no, no. There's a short story in here. You really need this. And it turns out ABC had bought the property. And then they were already putting it in cycle to put it in on as a TV movie. So it's about October when this happens that Spielberg says, well, I want that gig. And he calls his agent. He calls everybody he knows. He'd done some television. Like I said, he he had a Columbo that I haven't even, Mm -hmm. it was the first Columbo that hadn't even aired yet. That was like, his really right. He, yeah. Oh, I didn't know it was the first one. It was the first night. Night gallery is wonderful. With, 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 uh, right. With, uh, Joe Crawford, Crawford, which is, I mean, amazing. And we talked about Spielberg and that episode. There's actually one we did just about talking about Steven Spielberg. And that's on our Patreon page. If you want to hear that anyway, so he takes that, he, he asks around and then somebody finally says, okay, can you do it in 10 days? And he's like, sure. Cause you, that's what you say. You know, you, you just want the gig. It's, it's baffling. I know, I know it's just a car scene that, I mean, a car chase that goes on for 90 minutes, but how did they shoot it in that short of a time? Well, it I was, don't, it, I don't get it. It was 73 minutes then because it was a 90 minute TV movie in November, and it was on a Saturday night. And back then, and we've talked about this before, TV movies in the 70s and 80s got huge ratings. Big deal, yeah. They were a big deal. There was always like the movie, they used to be like the movie of the week, and then it was the Monday movie of the week, and then it was the Monday and the Wednesday movie of the week. It was exactly like how Netflix produces things today. So it was big budget that the network's and there were only three of them at the time right. that they would devote to these um, these movies. And yeah, you would stay in and watch the movie of the week. It was a Saturday night. I mean, that's what you never think people program Saturday nights now, but that people used to do that because people would stay home and then they needed something to watch. So it's this movie that comes out in November. It's about a month before his 25th birthday. He had 10 days to do it. He said, OK, but we have to be on on site we have to actually be on roads and they said what are you nuts and he says no this is really the difference it makes so he gets them to commit to 10 days doing it on the road he hires two of the best stunt drivers in the business to the driving in this movie incredible 
re- seriously. Like, and we did a while back, um, the Fast and the Furious, mm-hmm. which is like the now is now the gold standard of of driving uh, movies. But this is really impressive. Yes. He has a, so he hires Dennis Weaver, and I never he was in McLeod. That was a show my mom would watch. Do you remember that? That's what I was trying to remember. Like, what is that show? I remember he had like turtlenecks and uh, you know, yeah, McLeod. cowboy boots, and he was in the city. Like that yeah. was his whole thing. My mom like had such a crush on him. She watched every week. Steven Spielberg picked him because he had seen. His performance in Touch of Evil, which is an or- Orson Welles That's production. That's what it's called. Yes. I always forget he's in Touch of Evil, which is one of my Me favorite too. movies. But he has. It's a great movie. He he plays this very uh, scared, flippity gibbet of a guy, like a person. And so Stephen, it's not McLeod. It's not McLeod. He's not cool <laughs> no. and calm. He's no. trying to. The whole thing with the character is that his name is Man in the story. We, don't, we never see the truck driver. We don't know what he looks like. And the whole thing is that they're chasing each other down the east, and he cannot shake this guy. He goes into a diner, and he shows up there. He goes slower. He the, the truck goes slower. He goes faster. The truck goes faster. It's always finding him. And then he has to be, basically come up with a way to have the truck go over a cliff. And that's and then there's a big explosion because also on the truck it says flammable. Flammable. And he's always scared. What if it just blows up in front of me? Yeah. Yeah, or what if I rear end this guy, Kablooey, right? Right. Um, And the story, it's so well written. Right. It's It's really good. Really, the writing is so awesome. Um, As someone who spends a lot of time on California roads, right? (laughs) He really captures that the way you're. It's so weird, you know. uh, You you do these long haul drives, which I hate myself, but I've done so many of them in my life. You're on these drives and the challenge is always like, I got to keep my eyes on the road, even if there's nobody around, because who knows some bird or some deer or something's going to run out in the road. Yep. But also your mind is wandering because it's so freaking boring. Right. And so I love the way he captures this, the, the driver man, um, his mind, he's a salesman. So he's thinking about like, oh, I got to land this client, or my boss is going to like really be after me. Oh, look at those houses there. Why? Who would live out here? I can't imagine. Oh, look, they've got a pet cemetery. That's kind of that's awfully sweet. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there's that truck again. Okay. You know, and it's, and it's he really. I love the way that he writes that. It, it's so natural sounding. It, it's so that's how you experience being behind the wheel on these long haul. Um, drives. And if you have done these long haul drives, then you certainly have had these awful situations of trucks menacing you on the road. I don't know how else to put Right. It. Well, a lot of truck drivers, other drivers. Not all, okay, not all truck drivers, but a lot of truck drivers. It's a very, it's a profession where they have to be up sometimes for several days it on little so sleep. It's so hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they have to, and some of them, oh God, the ones with like the two or three trailers behind yeah them. i would be i would just i could never do it i would just don't have the nerves no but it's, it's hard it's very difficult job they're just trying to get one place to the other because that's how they make their living and they they don't have a lot of patience for slow people or anything <laughs> which i understand which i get now, there's some there's some see there's some differences between the the story and the movie which we'll talk about but there's one there's one really chilling scene in the story that I'm not sure is in the movie or if it is, I don't remember it. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things that's really makes both versions extremely suspenseful is that you never see the driver of the truck. Right. You, you just, it, it never happens. And so, and the other thing that I think is it's a little bit different you don't get this in the movie at all, I don't think. At first, when man, the um, the salesman is driving, he passes the truck, which is what you do. He passes the truck, and then the truck whizzes by him. He's like, whoa, okay, maybe something, maybe I misread that situation, is his first thought. And then, so then he, pretty soon he comes up and he's behind the truck again, and the truck is crawling along. And so it's safe. He checks to make sure it's safe. 
he passes the truck again. And this time he passes the truck and the truck, and this happens in the movie, the truck goes wah, wah, like really long as he's passing him. And man, it, this isn't in the movie, but man in the story is like, oh, I wonder if he's saying hello. That's, right. What a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> He doesn't, he's just wondering, you know, he just, he's assuming the best. Right. And then there's some point where, like you said, we don't see him. We don't know what he looks like. He just sees a tan arm on on the left side. He just sees his arm. It's very important. Right. Because at one point the arm waves at him. Like, okay. Waves him like, hey, it's safe for you to pass. Which I've done before. Have you? I mean. So have I. Yes. They're like, we can't keep, you know, here, here's a solid. Here you go. You're free to go. So you're like, thank you. And he says, he says, okay. And then he takes off. And then that's when another car is coming right at him that he couldn't see in the first place. So he almost took out not only him, but this other, and it's, then he's going, what is going then he on he realizes here? This, this guy was just trying to kill me. Yeah. yeah. And this other person didn't care if this other person was killed. Yeah. Which is perfectly same- willing to sacrifice these other people of the car. And then he realizes what he's dealing with. He's trapped in the car. It's so interesting. And Steven Spielberg, we'll, we'll talk about the movie, but but one of the things that is so cool about the story, and, and Matheson is so, like, I Am Legend is a lot like this too. As this man is in the situation and the pressure is mounting and mounting and mounting, and they have the scene where they go to the cafe and he's trying to figure out which one is the driver and he's wrong every time and there's this point where I think that's where the where it starts to really shift. So he's in the cafe. He's trying to work out which one is the driver. And each time he's wrong. And while he's trying to figure it out, the truck starts taking off. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I totally missed who the driver is. And now the truck is going. And he goes out and he's running after this semi truck, which is ridiculous. Right. And at this point, like he starts to really become unhinged, our, our driver, a man, the 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 salesman. And as the chase is continuing and the, and it's getting really dangerous, it's getting just increasingly more dangerous. This truck is really messing with this guy. The, the salesman is starting to, um, he's starting to lose his sense of, of what the right thing is to do. You know, um, really in this situation, there are certain points that we're just get out of the car, dude. Just get out of the car. Call just the run. He, what is he going to He's not going to get out. He can't quickly get out of this giant truck. Right. Easily. You know, clearly, yeah, get out of the car and call the cops. But he's like, no, I can't. I can't get out of the car no matter what happens. And then the car starts to fail. It starts to overheat, which was a thing you used to see all the time. Remember in the 70s? I had a how, car that how did many that in times the 90s. In, I, I can't tell you how many times before, like, 1995, I'd been in an overheating car. Yes, Remember, same. you had to pull over, oh, yeah. cool you couldn't the thing use, off. You couldn't use the air conditioner because that was taking up too much power. Turn on the heat. Even, it doesn't on. matter how hot it is. Yeah. Oh, you're bringing back so many memories. Right? It was so horrible. Oh, it was horrible. It was so horrible. <laughs> it happened all the time, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. So this is driving and And also, I know what it's like because I'm from, I lived in Northern California. I went to college mm. in Northern California. Margo's from Southern California. I've driven to LA and back. That's San Francisco, from San Francisco. Yeah. There's lots of stretches like that. Lots of stretches where it's just like people say, field, 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 field. And then mm-hmm. there's a house and then field, field, yeah. field. <laughs> And if you go on 101, it's really beautiful, but it takes you a lot longer. So it's Highway yes. Five, but that's a highway. He's on a, you know, he's on a highway. He's not on a freeway. A freeway. Yes, exactly. Has he's not on lanes. the freeway. He's on the highway, like the PCH or something like that. Um, in the story, in the movie, it's a little bit different, and we'll talk about that. But right. um, which he regrets. Yeah, he's 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 like, becoming uh, yeah. <laughs> He's becoming unhinged. Like he's starting to, he's not making sense. Like he really thinks he's, even as the car is failing around him, he's like, I can't leave this car. I can't get out of the car. If I get out of the car, he's going to get me, which is like, you need to do get out of the car. (laughs) But he just, he's lost his grip. Yeah. And Matheson is so amazing at, you know, as taking you on step by step on how that can happen when you're in this crazy pressure, mortal danger situation. And then spoiler alert, just like in the movie, um, uh, he swerves, although it's not, no, in neither case is it planned. It just happens that he swerves, he loses control of the car 
and the tr- the truck is so trained on him that it goes off of a cliff before it can stop itself right. and explodes because it's full of flammable liquid. And even then, the our salesman, he's really lost his grip on things and he can't even like – He's basically reduced to just like your most primal lizard brain, you know, of just like, (laughs) I I survived. Yippee, you know, Um, and that's how the story ends. It is. It's such a simple idea. Right. But it is such a gripping, well-written, just like you have this whole it's all about the inside of this salesman's mind the whole time. And it is riveting. It's, it's awesome. And it's a short story. I mean, oh, it's very short. Yeah. I it, I got it through Libby, my Libby app. My library had it. There's audiobooks. I listened to an audio reading of it. It's only an hour, but it's really really interesting and it's incredibly well done. And like you said, this is a great idea for a story and it gets picked up by ABC. So it, like we said, ABC a couple of nights a week had these TV movies and they got monster ratings. So they would sell and but they, I didn't realize they would film them so close to when they were expected to air. Like I was surprised about that too. Oh that seems God. so risky, doesn't it? it like, does. what if something goes wrong? What if, what if it, what if you have a, a freak thunderstorm like we've been having here lately? What do you do? What do you do? I don't know, but it's November twentieth is the date it has to be released. So he has, it's like a month out that he's filming this, and he actually had to take. An extra three days, which he thought was going to get him fired because they were really on his case. Like, you you need to get this in on time. So Steven Spielberg said, OK, but we need to film it outside. I need Dennis Weaver. And then I have these two stunt drivers that I want to work with. And then one of the um, one of the dual uh, extras, like they had a DVD extra that I saw on YouTube, is Steven Spielberg said that he was so young that most of the crews were filled with people even in television that had been in the business for like 30, 40 years. What a blessing. Right. And he's, Mm -hmm. he's in charge on the set, but these people really know what they do, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can tell. And he, and he wants to learn because he want he has, he wanted to do Sugarland Express, which was one of his ideas and that's coming out and that's in a couple of years. So he, there's all this pressure on him. And he was, he said, I was so young and so ambitious. I didn't care how many hours it took me every day I was going to, I was going to do it. And so he, he hired the truck. Like you would hire an actor. Like they looked at all these different trucks. He decided he, I mean, a thing he did in television that was different from a lot of people is that he did wide shots. That was like one of his uh, calling cards. Like he was the new kid and that he was using TV this way. And so he wanted to have a red car and a red truck because they would stick out. And so the brighter red car belongs to Dennis Weaver, and then the red truck is the red truck. But they also, with the truck, they just made it look janky. They, like, put all kinds of oil and dirt and dust all over it. Plus, they added these license plates on the very front of it. How does this guy run around with, like, 12 license plates on the front of his car? Oh, no, that's how they used to have. Really? Yeah. I don't know why, because I don't understand about, like, trucking. But I remember because again I was I had so many of these long road trips as a child. You have a lot of time to like look at the trucks. That's all and we stuff. did when we were taking and vacations. <laughs> we were driving every never. So I wasn't on a plane till driving. I was like sixteen. I don't understand it. And the, I mean, I know gas was cheap, but the cars were like you know half a mile a gallon. Um, but they would have trucks would be registered in multiple states. Oh, that makes if they sense. were doing if they were doing interstate trucking. Um, you would have like Nevada, and it was usually like the Southwest, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, California. Um, and that's something that the story points out too, that the truck, which I think is supposed to tell us that this is a driver who does like super long haul trucking. So, so he's, he's, this is his domain. Well, also, Steven Spielberg said it, it's also the sign that he's like a serial killer because he thinks those license plates come from the victims that he's. 
That's what Spielberg said. Really? Yeah. Wow, interesting. So that I was like, yes, it's really, it's a good GC detail. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take a quick break? We'll play the ABC promo video. It was like a little commercial they would put out to get you to want to watch the movie. And then we'll talk about this movie. that car head on. Dennis Weaver. Okay, Jack, I've had it. <laughs> Why? Why is he doing this? Duel. We should also say that Richard Matheson wrote the screenplay with Steven Spielberg. So it's his story that he's continuing. And he'd written several teleplays before. So that's nothing new for him. Mm -mm. And they have Carrie Lofton is the, uh, the truck driver and he's sort of the main stunt guy. And, and Steven Spielberg uses all these tricks to make this gigantic truck look like it can go fast. There's all these little tricks of camera. Yeah, yeah, let's be clear. It cannot <laughs> go 70 or, or like whatever it's doing no. in this movie. Yeah, it goes in the in the story. The truck is going like 70, which in those today sounds like, well, what's the problem then? But in those days, that was a big deal. If you were trying to outrun a truck that was going 70 miles an hour for a sustained period of time, yes, your car would overheat. Yes. Yes, your car would overheat. So he's so Dennis Weaver. They, what they we should also say is that there's two different versions. The original TV version was about 73 minutes because it was um, from like I think 8:30 to 10, or you know whatever on a Saturday night. So they didn't. It was only under 90 minutes, and the rest I guess was all ads, mm-hmm. but commercials, all yeah. commercials. So it's not even that long. It was like 70 minutes. I think he said it was the final, and it becomes this huge hit. I mean, we have. Dennis Weaver in the the extended version, which is what you see now, is the version mm-hmm. that Spielberg, the movie becomes a hit and they're actually going to show it in Europe on real screens because it was that successful. He now had no idea it would happen. But so then he had to come up with 10 extra minutes. And so they <laughs> threw in cursing and they threw in a couple of scenes that we'll talk about. But it's Richard. He, he starts the show. It's David Mann. And it starts with him. He's on the road and he calls his Dennis Weaver, calls his wife. He looks very handsome me, okay. in this movie, by the way. He's very handsome in the movie. He starts out like when we first see him. First of all, he's got a slick car, right? Because he's yeah. a salesman. Um, he's got he can't show up in a jalopy. Who's, nobody's going to hire him or give him their account. Kind of like how I was talking about my dad in the Mercedes last yes. week. Yeah. So he has kind of a kind of a slick little car. And he stops at a basically like a rest stop. It's like a trucking rest stop. And um, if you've ever been, again, if you've <laughs> if you've ever done long haul drives, and you've ever been in a trucking rest stop, a trucker rest stop, it's not just uh, gas and Kit Kats. It's you can get a shower there. It's got microwaves. You can heat stuff up. You can buy shaving cream and deodorant. You can get breakfast, lunch, dinner. You can do your laundry there, right? So he gets off at the truck stop. He goes to the payphone. He's calling his wife. As he's talking to her, and we'll talk about their conversation in a minute, which I think <laughs> I is really key, really key to this guy's character. This woman comes in to get her laundry out of the machine. In a Vera Newman sundress that I just want to reach into the screen and rip off her body. I want this dress. I remember this dress from the 70s. It, I, I was like, oh, that's the dress. I love that dress. I want her dress. But it anyway. It had pockets. It had pockets. And it's pockets. And on a hot day, it was like nice and cool. It was enough to cover your body, but it was like, especially the, the you know, summer in California can last a really long time. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about where the film is shot before we get to this. Yes, this is your expertise. um, This is my area that that I happen to know very well. Um, So we are are east of Oxnard, California, which is um, the subject of my book, Growing Up in La Colonia. But, um, yeah, we're out by Santa Clarita. Um, What is that one? Acosta? Is that what that place is called? These are inland, you know, in... Not just rural, but it's even agri- east of the agriculture. It's pretty far. We're going into the desert. It's between the rich agricultural part of California and the desert. 
who is he meeting out there? Like, who is this client? I don't know. He's not going to San Francisco is what I'm saying. Right. He's going, he's going towards, towards uh, Arizona. But, um, but the plus thing is that you have all of these, it's all too, even today, it's all two lane highways. Um, a lot, a lot of it is two lane highways and, and you have these remote stretches like this where, yeah, you could shut it down and film an ABC movie of the week pretty easily there. Um, it is very hot. It is quite dry. He leaves his home. He li- I don't understand that. That's the one little nitpicky thing about this movie. And it's dumb. Um, cause he lives in Los Angeles, right? He lives mm-hmm. in kind of a nice house. We see at the beginning of the movie. I like the beginning of the movie. He drives through downtown Los Angeles and then he's, like. it's getting, which I like too. Very fun to see LA. Yeah. As I remember it from my childhood and, um, drives east, east, east. I want to say also, before we go on, that we've talked about Steven Spielberg so many times right. on this podcast. And we will. Again. And we will continue to yes. because he is the master. We have said it before. We will say it again. He is the master of the film adaptation. He can take a crappy story with a good little nugget like a killer shark and turn it into one of the greatest movies of all time. Now, in this case, he has a great story, mm-hmm. a great story that he's starting with and adapting. But he's he, even at this very, very, very young age, he has such a keen sense of using what do we call that showing not telling so using the visuals to tell the story to fill in give us some clues about who we're talking about and what's happening so he has this safe we see his safe little suburban home which is very like just perfect little americana um which reminds me sorry of um go ahead of poltergeist like he does a california suburb same. Yes, exactly. But he's so good at this. And I love like every time, not just that they're on the road and the remoteness of it. And there is, you can't help but think of the Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote. <laughs> but when he, st- every little stop that he makes, when he stops at Chuck's Cafe, which is in the story, that that scene is in the story. The scene with the, the bus, the bus, the school bus with mm-hmm. the kids. I, it's such a great scene. That's not in the story. That's all Spielberg. It's brilliant because, again, it just gives us more about who this man is and we can kind of understand a little bit about why he's reacting the way that he is. And and then, of course, my favorite scene, which is at the snake Arama. Come on, snake Arama. Is the woman that runs the snake Arama, was she in Bosom Buddies? She. Yes. Wom- yes. I yeah. love her. She was in a lot of things oh, in yeah. the 70s. Yeah, she's she's a wonderful character actress. And she really sells my snakes. My snakes. Um, <laughs> Can I check your oil for you? Okay. <laughs> she's so cheerful. And the oh, the gas station attack. Anyway, so yeah. so we'll talk we'll talk about all the scenes. So we just at the beginning of the movie. And he he gets and this scene I think is one of the auxiliary scenes that Spielberg has shot. So what I'm saying is all this extra stuff that he's could be so tacked on. He could have just like, okay, fine. Like, here's some more scenes of him driving in the desert. But he really adds to the story, adds to the richness of the characters with this extra stuff that he shot. So we have our salesman. He's just about to get onto a stretch where, you know, when you're on a road trip, you're like, okay, this is our last stop for, yeah, you know, four hours or whatever it's going to be. The last sign of civilization. Yeah. So it's one of those places. And um, he gets off to place a call to his wife and it's to apologize because we're and and we again show don't tell they're talking around what happened uh apparently they were at a party and a man at the party maybe a colleague maybe a superior of this guy was really getting handsy And crossing some lines with Mr. Man's wife, Mr. Salesman's wife. What does Mr. Salesman do about it at the party? Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) She says to him, he basically raped me, which she's just saying, like, like you said, super handsy. I mean, maybe he was leaning in for a kiss or he had his arms around her. You know, we've all been in those situations. And, And he's like, he didn't, you want your husband, I mean... For me, I, I it's the cave woman. I want like I, I want him to like really kind of handle the guy and be like, "Hey, yeah. get away from my wife. That's not cool." And he didn't do anything. And so mm-hmm. she's saying to him, like, 
what is and then Steven Spielberg also has a lot of movies where the fathers are ineffectual, where the fathers are This is true. are kind of a mess. And when we learn his biography, we're like he is very much talking about his own dad and his relationship to his dad and and so here's a dad that's like He's not sticking up for his spouse. He's he, and it could be like you said, probably a boss or somebody. You know, it's yeah. one of his clients, and he doesn't want to upset them. So she has to put up with the crap and has to understand yeah. that. And she's saying, "No, no, yeah, it's not okay." We also see in the shot, we because we see her in the house again. The very very nice middle class house. We also see that he has a son, which is kind of an interesting. Uh, little angle. He has a son who's there with a friend, I think, because those two boys look like they're the same age, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so you know, he is the male role model, and he's being called out for not modeling very good behavior. But he's calling to apologize, like he's as he's been driving, he's kind of ruminating, he's listening to the talk radio, and he realizes, like, oh man, yeah, I really, I didn't handle that right. So he he calls to him. apologize. Good on him. Yes. Yeah. And also you should listen like an I I I have to watch everything with the captions now because I blew out my hearing at 90s rock concerts Lollapalooza and all. Anyway, so when I watched it again this time I really listened to the radio that he's listening to and it's a goofy radio guy that's basically calling somebody and saying like, you know, I'm supposed to be the head of the house but actually my wife is the boss and he's I think he's talking to a census worker or something like that. And that's the whole goof. Like I could see that on the screen and, and Dennis is laughing. And then he realizes like, ah, oh, I had a fight with my wife too. And she's really the boss. I really should just apologize and tell her I feel bad about it. And so that's, so like, once again, like, is he an effectual guy? Does he tend to, you know, who's in charge? Is he the boss or is his boss the boss of him and his wife is the boss of him? Right. So like how much can he control? And, Exactly. How much can he control? And the other thing that it made me think of is so now he's so to having had all of that. Now he's getting back on the road. I don't remember if we have seen the truck driver yet at that point. Um, No, it's been. Yeah. First. Oh, and I should say we don't even see our salesman until five and a half minutes in. We're just seeing what he sees for those first five and a half minutes. So. uh, I live in San Diego. We, one of the things about San Diego is that we have like every, I think every branch of the military is here, you know, because of you know, being a port city and, and, and whatnot. Um, and so this is where sp- specifically I live where all of the recruits are sent to train, the, like a lot of training s- stations are near me. Um, there was, I, think, I don't think the naval, the naval one is there anymore, but we have Camp Pendleton. I live very close to the Marine uh, recruitment depot. I have all my life. And one of the things about that place is that you have these, they are kids, you know, they are teenagers, these young men, and, um, and they haven't had their training yet. And they're probably scared. They're in a, they're in California. They've never been to California before. Always when you – the thing – what I'm getting at is they you see their license plates like, oh, this one's from Oklahoma. This one's from Colorado, mm-hmm. whatever. They drive like maniacs in all of the neighborhoods that surround the marine recruitment. They always have. Like I don't remember a time when this was not the case because why – being behind the – this is the only thing that they – the little place that they have some kind of – they feel like they have some kind of domain. And so they will menace you on the road. Like you're, dude, we're in a Nate, we're like, there's a school right there. We're all supposed to be going 25 miles an hour. And you're like on my, my butt, like honking and, and, you know, revving. But it is this, like, at the same time, you're like, oh, (laughs) like you poor thing. (laughs) I'm sorry that this is all you have to, uh, uh, you know, that's within your control right now. It must be really hard. I really feel for them. It's an American Um, thing too, though. It is a very American thing because, I mean, I live in New York. I haven't had a car in like 20 years, but I know how to drive. And I've when I lived in California, there's been many, many times where I've go on road trips and it's how we get around. And there is a car culture in America. And a part of that is independence. It's about and I remember, especially as when I was a teenager, when I got my driver's license, like, yeah, be able to go away for a while. 
I mean, that's oh. how they sell it to us. That's, to, that's how they get out of uh, paying for public transportation. <laughs> yes, you know what? You're right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it is this um, trope, I'm going to say, I guess, mm-hmm. of, you know, the man who feels the toxic masculinity of I don't have control over anything in my life. I'm going to take it out on the road. And both of the men in this story are going through that, but to varying degrees mm-hmm. of uh, tenability. So our so we set this up, and now we have our salesman behind the wheel. He's coming up on this slow, slow, rickety old-looking semi-truck. I mean, this thing looks like it's been through. It's been back and forth across the country like 25 times at this point. And so he does what you would do. The road is straight. There is nobody else on it. He passes the truck. He doesn't do the thing in the story where he thinks like, oh, I guess, oh, hi, Mr. Truck Driver. Like he doesn't, he just is, this is something that he deals with all the time. This is part of his job. You know, he's just what he does. Um, But let me tell you, this is not in the story. I, I mean, they talk about it in the story. When you see it on the movie, it's much scarier. When he's past the truck, he's driving, and then the truck goes, zoom, and passes him. It's so scary. <laughs> like you're instantly like, that's not right. That's not how you do the thing on the road. That's not how we do. (laughs) It's so scary right away. It's so tense. How does it sustain being so tense for so long? I do not know. It's the music. But it does it so well. The music is awesome. Just like the whole thing, the, the cinematography, the angles, um, the the times that they go in on Dennis Weaver's face and the times that they there's you're seeing the kind of a long shot of his whole body sitting in the car versus the long shot of the car and the two, the truck to get that just the interplay of that is done in such an exciting dramatic way that you are riveted it is a hour and a half car chase and i am here for it right i, I should say that it's billy goldenberg is the composer he would go on to use uh john williams as his main composer but this the use i was thinking this is like when i'm watching this movie i'm like the use of sound in this film is excellent That is what it sounds like to be in a car. That's what it sounds like when a truck passes you for real. That's what it sounds like when you're at a train station and the, the, the thing comes down. That's what it sounds like when you go into a diner that's in the middle of nowhere. Like that's the kind of music you hear. That's the chatter that you hear. There's all of it is so realistic that adds to the te- So you relate to it. He's, yeah. Yeah. He, you really relate to this guy right away. And it's partly it's that it's that phone call. 
that you that really pulls you in with this guy like oh look at him like he's really trying he's trying um, yeah he, he's trying he lives in this very toxic masculinity world but he's a there's a guy in there and yeah he, he's a good guy and you don't want this to happen to him but here he is and just like in the in the book, that whole thing about Chuck's Cafe, which is a real restaurant in Santa Clarita. It's a French restaurant now. And it is kind of remote like that even today. The truck really, really gets very dangerous as they're approaching that Chuck's Cafe. And the car spins out. And I think... This is this for me, like this is where we really see Dennis Weaver's character start to go off the rails. He's when he hurts his neck, like I so buy that this man has really hurt his neck. All attempts to look macho and cool out the window. Right. He really is in pain. It's so and well he's done. terrified. He's just completely he's really terrified. Scared. And he can't make sense of it. So he goes into the I love it when he goes into the diner, like I said, and you just hear the sounds and everything. And he does that movie thing where he goes in and he puts cold water on his face, trying to like shock himself. And then I and normally we don't like interior monologues, but this is really done well because he has nobody to talk it's, to. He has nobody to talk to. And the story in the book we get it's all interior monologue. Do you have an aspirin? Oh, your headaches. Sure. I got you some. I did was pass this stupid rig a couple of times and he goes flying off the deep end. He has to be crazy. Okay, so he's crazy. What can I do about it? Find him a psychiatrist? There's no other way you you really I think if he had not done it, it it would have been just. But I but I also appreciate. When he does it, because up until now, we've seen him talk on the phone to his wife, we've seen him talk to the gas station attendant. We haven't I don't think we've gotten a snake arama just yet. He's talking back and forth to the radio like you do to stay awake on the road, you know, but this is the first point. And again, the Chuck's Cafe is a real critical point in the book as well, where things he starts to lose his grip at Chuck's Cafe. And so to introduce this interior monologue at that point, I think is the perfect. When else are you going to do it? Right. It's done very well. So he orders a, a cheese sandwich, Swiss cheese on rye, R-Y-E. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and she's like, all right. And he had gone to the bathroom and he's looking and all he knows about the driver is that he's probably white. He kind of saw the arm and that he has blue jeans and cowboy boots on. That's about all he knows. And you're at a truck stop in that part of California. That's everybody. That's everyone. That's That's pretty- the cook. <laughs> that Chef. Everyone. it's every truck driver that's going through that town and he's sitting there and he does this so well every person could be guilty every person could be that guy you're just like is that the one is that the one is that so the now one? he's starting to become paranoid yes a terror at twenty thousand feet kind of mm-hmm. moment and yeah he realizes like any one of these men, because the truck is across the street. He sees the truck is there mm-hmm. and he can see at this point that the driver is not in the truck. So where there's nothing else. There's no place else for the driver to be, but in here with me. So one of these guys is just trying to kill me. And, um, and is waiting for me to be done and then going to come out and kill me. So do I sit yeah. here forever? What do I do? So what do I do? Right. And so he orders the cheese sandwich. He's trying to eat. He's trying to drink. You know, he's drinking all the water. He's so nervous. I'm so sorry for him. I, I know. He does. It's such a good performance. Like he's it's such an amazing performance. It really is. Because he gets that yeah. paranoia. And you can't look like that in that that kind of place where they're used to regulars and people who come in all the time. Like he yeah. really stands out. And, yeah. And he's. And he's the, not a jaded truck driver. He is a ruffled salesman you know with his little like probably like clip on tie you know yes. with this, like all dressed up to impress the the potential client with his little sports car and he is just coming unhinged right i love that scene i don't think that scene 
is in the book where he goes and confronts, like he tries to deduce which one it is. No, it's not. And he not. thinks it's this guy. Oh and, my and God. so he goes and confronts him. That whole scene. Look, uh, I want you to cut it out. What? Just, just cut it out, okay? For where? Now, come on, I mean, please, I, I don't, let's not play games. What the hell are you talking about? I can call the police. Police? You think that I won't? You're wrong, mister. You, you, if you think you can take that, that truck of yours and just use it as a murder weapon just <laughs> and killing people on the highway, well, you're wrong. You've got another thing coming. Man, you need help. Don't you tell me I need help. Because at two seconds in, I'm like, oh, that's not the guy. He would. That's not how he would react. That's not. I mean, I did no. Anyway. You could tell by his reaction. Like this guy's not bluffing. Like he really doesn't know what you're talking about. He's dude. eating a burger with his left hand and a drink in the right hand. They're like the whole time, like just back and forth. So Dennis Weaver, he thinks it's he might be a driver, but then they, it's a really good visual trick. He's like walking to another truck, and so he doesn't know. So he he leaves. He goes on the road and he's this man is still following him. And there are just there's one point where he he thinks he eludes him and then he shows up again. There's there's a point where he sees there's like we said, there was a scene with a bus bus driver with school children. Right. OK, so in the story, as we said, in the book, there's this very scary scene where the bus drive. I mean, the truck driver waves him over like, you're good to go, dude. And then it, it's actually setting him up to die right. by running into oncoming traffic and killing these innocent people. In the movie, we have this extra scene that's not in the book, though, but it's it does a similar it has a similar effect where it sort of flips that idea. He he Dennis Weaver's driving. He sees this broken down um, school bus. Now he's pulling over. We presume to ask for help to be like, "Did you see that truck? You you, you, oh, you got to help me. This guy's trying to kill me." Da 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 da. But before he could even get that out, the bus driver's like, "Oh, I'm so glad you're here. You got to help us. You gotta, you gotta give me a push. The, the the bus is overheating and it won't start up again. And I got these kids and I got to get it back. Da, 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 da. You got to help me. You got to help me, dude." And Dennis Fever's like, "I think, I think my car's too low. I think my car's just gonna go under your bus." He's like, "No, no, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine." And of course, that's what happens. But Dennis Weaver has this urgency, like, we've got to get ev everybody, especially these kids, we've got to get them out of here because this killer is out there. He's going to try to kill us all. We are all in terrible, terrible danger. But he's not able to push the car because the car gets stuck. They, they free the car. He's like, I'm sorry. I try to help. I'll see what I can do. As he takes off, he sees there's the truck coming for the kids. And he's like, oh, my gosh. And the truck just, like, slows down and helpfully pushes the school bus. <laughs> right. He's not after them. He's not after them. No, he doesn't want them. <laughs> and he's letting him know, like, no, I want you. You're you're yeah. my prize. It's you, dude. It's, it's no, you. This really is it's all in, about it you. It is you. It's all about you. <laughs> you want it to be all about you. It's all about you. There's also a scene that they added to the movie where he goes to a train station and the lights are coming down and he's like, okay, 
you know, here comes the train coming by. He's just sitting there. And then right behind him comes the truck and it's pushing him <gasps> towards this passing the train. train. It's like, it's so well done. It's and this, so well there's, done. This is, these are the things that have made this movie a part of the American vernacular. You see it, like I said, you see a parody. One of my favorite parodies of this movie is the Bob's Burger Christmas special. Did you oh, ever I see that one? No. Oh, it's so good. There's a Bob's Burger uh, episode where the family, I forget why, the circumstances, but the family is in a car, they're going home for Christmas, and they get into it with this a semi truck that's shaped like a candy cane. It's this huge, menacing candy cane, and they're like, ah! <laughs> yeah, it's totally a takeoff on duel, but it's so genius the way, you know, as Dennis Weaver is realizing, because for, yeah, there's road rage, and we've, you know, if you've, you're an American, you've experienced road rage. Nowadays, you don't mess with those people because they might have a firearm in yeah, the car. And unfortunately, so you just yeah. like, you like hang back. I'm like, okay, it's all your, it's your road, dude. Go ahead. Right. Um, in those days, that was not so much the case. Steven Spielberg is so brilliant at, he sets up all of these different scenes. There's a scene where an, a, a senior kind of elderly couple come in a car and yes. he flags them down where he demonstrates like the truck driver doesn't care about these old people in the car. The truck driver doesn't care about the train. The truck driver doesn't care about this kids in the school, but he just wants you. Right. He only wants you. And he's not, he's not, he doesn't even care about himself. He's no. going to, if it means his truck blows up, he kind of doesn't care as long as he gets you <laughs> is what we kind of realize, you know, and it just builds and builds and builds. We have the snake arama the snake arama scene Again, my favorite scene of the whole movie. He gets out. He goes to the um, phone booth at the snake Arama, And the lady's like, be sure and check out my snakes. <laughs> <laughs> she's got these snakes. They're in the middle of nowhere. And I don't she's... understand this. She has snakes in glass vitrines, live snakes, like with the sun blazing down on them for some reason. And I don't the, get that. And the chuck, but and it's the very funny. It's like chained to the thing, which like was... It's like people used to do that. Like it's I, people did used to do that. Was a thing do, you saw a lot. But um, um, but she says and a phone a, booth and a phone in the middle booth. of the snakes. <laughs> and, and a lot of people wouldn't know what a phone booth is. So yeah, he goes to he says, "Does that phone booth work?" And she's like, "Yeah." He goes, "It's an odd place for it because it isn't an odd place. They had to put it an odd place because the truck is gonna just run it. He's on the phone." <laughs> <laughs> calling the police calling the cops <laughs> and the truck comes and just bashes through and dennis weaver did his own stunts he just oh jumped my, out of it it's just so in time good. it's so amazing hi help you mister you got a telephone out in the back this way Something for your car? Uh, well, you can uh, put what ethyl you can get in the tank. All righty. Would you mind checking those radiator hoses? I'll do that. Take a look at my snakes if you have time. Weird place for a telephone booth. Operator. I'd like to report a truck driver that's been endangering my life. In that case, I'll have to give you the police, sir. Right, well, give me the police. Sir, which department do you want? Whichever's closer. What number are you calling from? Uh, this, this number is 9821.
And the poor snake. Then, of course, the snakes are out. And then there's like a spider crawling up the leg. I mean, it just all goes. And then you can go back to uh, Indiana Jones. There's so many things that like. So many. It's the, it's just so delicious. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, like I said, Spielberg is just like building and building like this truck has a mind of its own it's not even about the guy in the truck anymore it's just like this truck is gonna get this driver so that when we get to the point where dennis weavers and this this is my other favorite scene because i just think he does this so beautifully when his car is starting to overheat and he's he's just speak at this point he is now just a hunted animal Mm -hmm. and he can't even have the presence of mind to again get out of the freaking car get out of the car dude just go and run among the rocks he's not gonna he can't drive up there he can't drive up into the rocks just get out of the car he's not getting out of the car he's screaming and pleading with the car to keep going it's amazing right it's it's so like he's so it's so primal childlike and again not not based on He's not thinking clearly at all. He's just begging the car to keep going, <laughs> which is what happens in the book too. But Dennis Weaver does it so beautifully. It's so good. It's so, it's great. So he, so finally there is this point where they're by a cliff and he figures out, well, if I pretend that I'm just going to jump over, you know, I'm just going to go run the it, car off the cliff. He'll follow me. And so I just have to jump out in time so that I don't go over with the car. And so it's like that's the story and that's what's in the movie. Mm-hmm. He sets it up so that he puts his briefcase to put the pedal to the metal and the car goes over. And then, spoiler, the truck goes over, which is what we've been waiting for. And the thing that he doesn't do is he doesn't blow up the truck. The truck just does this tumble. And, yeah. And it makes these sounds and he uses these sounds in Jaws and he uses these sounds in Jurassic Park later where the T-Rex mm-hmm. shows up. He it's just this jangle of the giant right. falling. Yeah. And that's what he wanted. And that's mm-hmm. all he wanted. You don't get the big explosion. It said flammable this whole time. So yeah. you're kind of like, well, it's happening. And Dennis Weaver's just so deliriously happy because finally, yeah. And, yeah. and then I'm like, 
where are you? Who's going to come get you? Like He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know where he is. He's in the middle of nowhere. Literally middle of nowhere. No no water, no nothing, but he's alive. Mm-hmm. He, he vanquished his enemy. He, and he, yeah. he outsmarted him. And maybe this will... This will <laughs> can you imagine these stories at like dinner parties for years? Like he's... <laughs> it's it's so good yeah it's such a great movie um i mean the story is fantastic you know which helps of course but we really see the really brilliant mind of steven spielberg to take the source material and turn it into turn it into pictures that Mm -hmm. tell that story in a way that hook you in and um and make you think, yeah. but yeah, you, I mean, you think about like, you can't help but think like, oh, gosh, I've been on, I've been on that road. I have literally been on that literal road. I, you know, uh, huh. you so connect with this guy. Um, and he does it so well. Like I said, you don't even see Dennis Weaver until five and a half minutes in. And by the time, you know, by the, you see him for all of like 15 seconds before you are just like in with this guy, you, you're, you're, you're in, you're in with him. This is the guy, all of the, all of the, the um, I don't want to call them extras, but the, these these additional character actors that we have. The that first gas station attendant with the limp. Yeah, he's fantastic. They're all um, really good. They're all so good. The waitress at Chuck's Cafe, all right. of the men in Chuck's Cafe, uh, the old man when the car spins out in front of the cafe that comes out and is like checking on Dennis Weaver to see if he's okay. All of them are so so good. You just you just buy that they live in this. You know they live in. At Chuck's Cafe, or they live at Snake Arama, and, and you just totally buy every single person in this movie. Uh, it's so good. <laughs> he used that Snake Arama, the the actress who does the Snake Arama stuff. Um, he used her in the movie 1941, which I've never seen. And then the old couple that's in the car that don't get run over, but they take off. He uses them in Close Encounters. There's a scene where they're featured in close. So he tries, he does those. It's Lucille Benson. Sorry. That's the lady at snake o <laughs> My snakes. My snakes. <laughs> Just so cheerful. Can I check your oil? Can I do anything else for you? <laughs> sure you can, ma'am. <laughs> I just love, yeah, she's so good. But they're all good. All of these people, all these little characters that come in and out of this story are so, they're just living their lives. Yeah. You know, this is where they live and this is the kind of stuff they see every day. And the the big truck is sort of like Snuffleupagus. Like they kind of don't ever see the big truck or acknowledge the big truck really. Um, certainly not as any kind of a menace, except for the snake lady. When she carries the snake with her, like, like oh, poor baby. Oh, I know. Uh, it's so brilliant. It's such a brilliant. He's so smart. <laughs> it's such yeah. a brilliant movie. Your fans. <laughs> Your fans. Um, it's really good. It's so good. And there's a reason why, like, it just entered the American imagination and culture, right? I mean, this was right away. This movie came out before I was born. Um, so I don't ever remember a time where people weren't talking about this movie. Yeah. You'd be on a road trip and you'd be like, oh, don't pass this guy. Um, I wonder how truckers felt about that. <laughs> I'm sure they loved it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure some of them are like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, get out of my way, dude. Um yeah, it's just, I just love it. Uh, so for that reason, I will have to say, I will have to say movie. I'm going to say movie too. And also because Richard Matheson wrote the script. So that, that Indeed. works out perfectly. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, you could it's tell. It's an A plus. Yeah. The stuff that the, he added, the choices that he made in adapting it for the, for the screen are perfect. Absolutely perfect. Love them. Yep. So very exciting. Look at how long we've talked about this movie about a car chase. I, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it was a hit in Europe. It was. It was a huge hit. Yeah. And then, like, yeah, when it came out on vid- video, it was a big deal. And yeah, I, yeah, you get it. So it is African American History Month. Again, yay. yay. We were just looking at our list of um, titles that we've kind of been compiling as our listeners have been suggesting them over the last year. And we have decided that next week we are going to do Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which I am very excited about. 
Me too. It's August Wilson is our author. It's a pretty easy, it's a play. It's pretty easy to get mm-hmm. your hands on and the movie is, is available everywhere. So it works out perfectly well. We're excited about that. I've never seen it. So I'm really Nor have eager. I. Yeah. It was just one of those was always on my t- watch list and I just never got to it. So I'm excited that we're going to finally do it. Yeah, me too. That, so that's the show this week. Please follow us on all the places we mentioned before. Give us your suggestions. The email, once again, is book versus movie podcast. Spell it out at gmail.com. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Brooklyn Margo. Instagram, it's at Brooklyn Fitchick. My site is brooklynfitchick.com. And my TikTok is Margo Donahue. And I've been posting a lot of like filmed in Brooklyn kind of things there. So let me know what you think. We will be back soon with a new episode. Thanks so much for listening. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. I'm probably not the best kind of judge of how many sides I have as a picture maker. One film I can say, I indulged myself in that. That was for me or that's for the audience. That's popcorn and that's brain food. I don't know if I'm the best judge of that, really, because I I take all my movies seriously. I took Raiders of the Lost Ark seriously. I had to. I had to believe the story was really happening. If I thought it was a romp and a confection, then the film would have been a parody of the serials from the 1950s and 40s. But I took that story very, very seriously. And I wanted the audience to believe that Indiana Jones was actually going after the lost Ark of the Covenant. And when that Ark opened, the power of God was within and was going to wreak havoc on the Nazis. I mean, I, I believe that stuff. And, and I don't think you can be a filmmaker, a serious filmmaker, making audience popcorn movies unless you believe the stories you're telling. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and look for Book vs. Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book vs. Movie Podcast group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book vs. Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book vs. Movie Podcast. Spell it all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D. at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P. at She's Nacho Mama.